Now we're here celebrating your 70th birthday, probably the best part of 60 years in the music industry, possibly longer if we count those fairly early uh, attempts to uh, pick up the piano as a child. Uh, and uh, we're amongst uh, the, the instrument that uh, you've, you've made your own, really, to, uh, two f fine examples of, of the instrument uh, in Eve Bergman's home, which we have especially laid on for you for the Thank celebration. You. I'm just honoured. Uh, can I ask you about the music that you're going to be playing, uh, the two pieces of music which you know very well? Yes. <clears throat> which Does that mean that uh, it is possible to understand the pieces of music without knowing where they came from, where the composer was coming from? It's a very good question. A lot of people liken um, a piece of music to the circumstances which surrounded it. Okay, there's a certain interest there, but in the end I like to regard it as pure music, and I think much more is transmitted through that music alone, that intangible power, than the circumstances regarding its creation. Furthermore, I think with every brilliant um, musician or, or composer or genius, there is correspondingly a, an undeveloped side. There has to be, because it's like a laser of intensity. I mean, you don't judge Beethoven by his housekeeping, for example, which was chaotic, but the music is a very different matter, uh, even though the writing wasn't. Um, also chaotic it was, but um, you judge somebody by what they do well, I think. But with something like the Beethoven, for example, the Eroica, which had so many, uh, I don't know if it, we can talk about it having political overtones of the time, even though they're quite confused, mm. is, yes. is it still possible to, to uh, go through a piece without having that in the back of your mind? Yes. Modern audiences won't know about the, the history, I guess. I don't think it's necessary. I think the music says it all. But I may you know, be unpopular by saying that. I just think that people, they're used to reading uh, about works, they're used to reading about the, the uh, private lives of these composers, they're used to liking uh, pieces of music with a, a name to them. In the end, the more, the more intangible it gets, the better. Um, similarly, I don't think Beethoven's performances, or, sorry, I don't think his works could have been improved if he'd taken them to a committee. You know, I don't think necessarily the majority would always know best. I think if you're dealing with a supreme genius like that, it's a matter between himself and the creative force. You don't have any questions for him, do you? I mean, if you look at a score, do you sometimes wonder what on earth was he trying to achieve there? Yeah, but by contemplation and silence, very often the answer can come to you. It may not be the right answer, but it's convincing. if it's convincing to you, then it probably will be convincing to your public. I think each concert requires a three-part um, say in it. You need the creator, obviously, that's the composer. The recreator, that's the performer. And the receiver, which is the public. And I think if you take any of that away or modify it in any way, as with the recording, for example, it's, it's far less satisfactory. In, in terms of uh, seeing the performance, it, it is a, a mixture of, of yourself and you have the piano and you have the work and you have also have the orchestra. Now, how important is it that you uh, have the orchestra on your side. Do you see yourself as separate from the orchestra or are you part of uh, this, this living being that we see on stage? I see myself as part of it, um, but in a slightly exalted position because I've got a bit more responsibility than some of the players. That's it. I just think of it as one unity and I don't think of it as the orchestra or the conductor accompanying me. I think, of it's, I think it's a collaboration. And there's nothing better than when you get everyone on that same sort of level of inspiration or whatever you like to call it, which grips you during a concert or should do, anyway, at least at certain concerts. I suppose we then have to talk about the conductor. So is it, is it crucial that you get the, the right conductor who is working so closely with you as that channel, I suppose, with the orchestra? I've worked with hundreds of conductors, and f the vast majority of them are professional enough to respect what you want. They don't get in the way. Um, there are a hand, there's a handful of conductors I shan't work with again. Well, I think three of them have passed away, which is not a, not a large number. Uh, but if you do get an awkward customer and he really wants to show off during the rehearsal and says, this should be the tempo and you should do this there, then to save time, I sometimes pretend I'll agree with him because uh, it's, it's, it saves the orchestral time too. When it comes to the concert, if they're going to be that impossible, the public doesn't pay their ticket in order to hear the conductor's piano concerto performance. So I go on, again, a bit bloody-minded and play it the way it has to be as far as I'm concerned. And the orchestra is no fool. They, they will always follow even if the conductor can't. And they're not really going to wheel you off stage in the middle of a performance, are they? No, there's been times when I've had altercations with the conductor before and during a performance. Then we just bow separately and go off in different directions. <laughs> I mean, a career of 60 years, that is an astonishing achievement, really. I think uh, possibly you don't feel that necessarily. Nothing like it. I think music 
somehow keeps you young and it's possibly the challenge and the enthusiasm that goes with it. I mean, many orchestral members have got tremendously uh, advanced sense of humour and uh, they've got uh, great imagination. It's part and parcel of being a musician. So although my job is quite uh, responsible and, and serious for long periods, I love humour. I love one-liners. I like uh, certain vintage um, comedians. You know, I get enormous uh, refreshment from that. And also I think you should keep your list of interests quite, quite high. I, I, when people say they're bored, I'll never understand how they can say that because there simply aren't enough hours in a day. So I think I'm very, very lucky to have that outlook and the certain ability I do for making music. Um, but I think whatever you do in life, you have to work hard at it. You can't suddenly expect to have everything on your lap as a privilege. You have to work that high in order to try to grasp powers that are, are waiting to, to help you, which are are available to all people, which are so neglected nowadays in this material, instant age we live in, full of noise. Just looking back over the 60 years, I mean, that is one change that uh, you, you've mentioned, that perhaps the, uh, the, the professional lives of musicians has possibly changed, maybe for the, the worse over that time. But are there, are there other things as well? We've seen new technology coming in. Uh, apparently you rather like new technology. Oh, I love electronic gadgets, yes couldn't live without them. They've always amazed me. Um, but the trouble is, as machines become more like people, people are inclined to become more like machines. So unfortunately, when it comes to the higher aspects of inspiration, which I don't think any computer can ever be, that's inspired, that's our saving grace, I hope, then of course it's going to be a compromise and people's endeavours for excellence will gradually perish. It's a pity, because if you're just going to have one large eye and a big finger to press a button, future generations, that's not very much of an achievement. You were telling me before we started the interview that you have a, a tablet and that's where you do a lot of your research with the scores these days. How much research do you actually put into the music? How long does it take before a concert? Well, you mean how long do I like to prepare? For, it depends on, on the sort of music and whether it's very much in your fingers at the time. But I think one of my duties is not only just to prepare for the next concert, the next concerts, uh, but also to keep learning new music because it keeps you well-oiled, it keeps uh, uh, my remaining brain self functioning reasonably well. And I think it's an obligation because it's like meeting people. The more people you meet, the more it helps those you already know. And it's to do with the experience of life. And the wider the repertoire, the better it helps the music you've already learnt. And we are so spoiled as pianists because we've got a vast repertoire to choose from. I often feel sorry for oboe players, bassoonists, because of that limitation. Um, we really are spoiled. I've played about 80 different concertos in, uh, during my career, but there are hundreds more to learn, hundreds more to play. And that's one of the great things about being a pianist. Do you need to have something like a 70th birthday to actually act as a focus, I think? Because obviously you're doing the Rachmaninoff and the Beethoven this time. I think it was the Schumann uh, for your 60th. Uh, I believe so. So does that mean you need to be edged towards a target or a goal? Are you, are you goal-driven? Yes, very much so. I think I'm pretty useless without that. I like the challenge and I like working to a deadline. Without that, things can fritter away and, and just, you know, become wasted. Um, I said earlier I've got lots of hobbies, but uh, obviously music is the number one passion. And often the hobbies are chosen to, to help the music, to refresh it. Because you can't talk music all day long. And one of the troubles about fellow pianists is that they're inclined to talk about piano technique, which is very limiting and boring because, you know, anyone can play the piano, especially if they're on the stage, it's taken for granted. But what I like to try to do is to make the piano into an orchestra um, because I love orchestral music and the colours involved. And I mentioned earlier about the, the importance of having a wide dynamic range, but always on every level it should have very good quality. Um, but also you've got to be your own severest critic. If I've played well one night, sometimes I do, I think, um, then you deserve to be pleased with yourself and have you know, a bit of a party with your friends. Next day you must do it better. I've spoken to some conductors who really don't want to know what's happening behind them. <laughs> they don't want to see the audience. So the true. smell of the audience. But do you, how do you relate to the audience? Do you like having the audience there? Or I do. To see them, right? I do. And as with orchestras, I feel they're instinctively on your side, apart from perhaps a couple of other pianists who might be there who would like to take my seat. Um, I've, on that tack, by the way, I've realised that as you progress in music, you realise very strongly that there's room for so many different sorts of pianists. They've all got their own public I remember Arau doing his last London concert, Festival Hall, and just before, just after that, was Horowitz. 
doing his last concert. Very different styles of piano playing, very different styles of public. Every person has got their own sort of public, and I'm certainly very grateful for mine. And uh, you're going to be seeing them in about seven different places, uh, <laughs> which is actually quite an extensive tour. Does that matter? Might be a different public for each, you never know. <laughs> Well, hopefully um, a, different, uh, a different public, but also a different uh, setting, a different yes. stage, a, a different uh, acoustic. Yes, this applies to all tours. Um, somehow, because of experience and because of your own, well, hopefully, hard-earned qualities, you can quickly adjust. Um, there is a, cer a certain ability that you can encapsulate all those circumstances very quickly when you come on, and after the first few notes, you feel at home, or you should do anyway. And that's helped by experience and getting older. You're performing in various halls uh, during the concert. Some are big, some are small. Does it really matter to you? Do you like the intimacy of, for example, the, uh, the waterside in Aylesbury? Or do you like the, the modernity of the Royal and Gate, for example? These are all refreshing things. I like both. I like the modernity as well as the uh, aged ones because they've got different qualities to offer. Um, I recently played in a brand new hall, three months old. I think I was the first pianist to play there. And I was knocked out by it. You know, that was literally built and opened three months ago. And that can be so exciting, as well as playing in a, in a very established hall. So the range is enormous and very exciting. For your 80th birthday, oh, <laughs> what plans do we have? My only plan now is to get better and to get uh, to a higher standard of enlightening my public with the original inspiration that gripped the composer at the time of conception, not after, because I think... Um, when you listen to certain composers play their own music, it's really quite removed from their original scores. Hearing Rachmaninoff playing his second concerto, first movement, it's pretty fast, but he puts moderato. And I com I'm convinced that Richter's version, for example, is more realistic compared with the way Rachmaninoff would have seen it in later years. Um, I think the important thing is to get to the original spark that gripped the composer at the time of conception. Not an easy task. And then to transfer that to your listening public with minimum distortion. Of course, there has to be interpretation with a small eye, but I don't like to do things to pieces. It has to be. It has to be inevitably done. And that's why it's rather like tasting a meal that's been cooked by an ex expert chef. You can't eat a recipe or you can't eat a menu in black and white. But the important thing is to make sure it tastes as if the chef hasn't got in the way, that it's the way, it, the way it tastes is the way it looks on paper. Let's imagine that you have decided that you want to um, give up the piano. You've already said you're not going to, so there's just a hypothetical question. And you end up on, on a desert island with a, a gramophone, uh, an old dance set or something like that. What piece of music, is there one piece of music that you would like to take with you? Possibly Beethoven's Grosse Fuga quartet. Otherwise, perhaps 111 sonata. It's not number 32, opus 111. It would probably be something searching like that. But to confine it to one choice is hard, if it's impossible. Because you've got to have so much in music, there's so much humour. I mean, I think one of the later Prokofiev symphonies would be a great choice as well. If he hadn't been overshadowed by such giants as Bach and Beethoven, Mozart, Brahms, then he would be high on the list. Well, he still is, of course, but I think he's very underrated at the moment. And fashion has got a lot to answer for, in a way, when you think that, I believe, um, Mahler is the third most played composer in London, or was. And yet, a few days ago, we had the 100th anniversary of Hindemith's death, I think, or was it 50th? Nothing was said. I read nothing about it. Now, Hindemith's a great composer, but not fashionable. John Rill, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you. Very much enjoyed it. <laughs>